A. The Doctrine of Predestination in History Predestination does not form an important subject of discussion in history until the time of Augustine. Earlier church fathers allude to it, but do not as yet seem to have a very clear conception of it. On the whole they regard it as the prescience of God with reference to human deeds, on the basis of which he determines their future destiny. Hence it was possible for Pelagius to appeal to some of those early fathers. According to Pelagius, says Wiggers, for ordination to salvation or to damnation, is founded on prescience. Consequently he did not admit an absolute predestination, but in every respect a conditional predestination. Augustinism and Pelagianism, page 252. At first, Augustine himself was inclined to this view, but deeper reflection on the sovereign character of the good pleasure of God led him to see that predestination was in no way dependent on God's foreknowledge of human actions, but was rather the basis of the divine foreknowledge. His representation of reprobation is not as unambiguous as it might be. Some of his statements are to the effect that in predestination God foreknows what he will himself do, while he is also able to foreknow what he will not do, as all sins, and speak of the elect as subjects of predestination, and of the reprobate as subjects of the divine foreknowledge, compared to Wiggers, Ibid, page 239, Dick. OMTEU Igwelbehagen, pp 39f, Polman, De Predestinatiale van Augustinus, Thomas van Aquino, E.N. Calvigen, pp. 149 ff. In other passages, however, he also speaks of the reprobate as subjects of predestination, so that there can be no doubt about it that he taught a double predestination. However, he recognized their difference, consisting in this that God did not predestinate unto damnation and the means unto it in the same way as he did to salvation, and that predestination unto life is purely sovereign while predestination unto eternal death is also judicial and takes account of man's sin, compared to D.Y.K., Ibid, page 40, Pullman, Ibid, page 158. Augustine's view found a great deal of opposition, particularly in France, where the Semipelagians, while admitting the need of divine grace unto salvation, reasserted the doctrine of a predestination based on foreknowledge. And they who took up the defense of Augustine felt constrained to yield on some important points. They failed to do justice to the doctrine of a double predestination. Only Gorchalk and a few of his friends maintained this, but his voice was soon silenced, and Semipelagianism gained the upper hand at least among the leaders of the church. Toward the end of the Middle Ages, it became quite apparent that the Roman Catholic Church would allow a great deal of latitude in the doctrine of predestination. As long as its teachers maintained that God willed the salvation of all men, and not merely of the elect, they could with Thomas Aquinas move in the direction of Augustinianism in the doctrine of predestination, or with Molina follow the course of Semipelagianism, as they thought best. This means that even in the case of those who, like Thomas Aquinas, believed in an absolute and double predestination, this doctrine could not be carried through consistently, and could not be made determinative of the rest of their theology. The reformers of the 16th century all advocated the strictest doctrine of predestination. This is even true of Melanchthon in his earliest period. Luther accepted the doctrine of absolute predestination, though the conviction that God willed that all men should be saved caused him to soft-pedal the doctrine of predestination somewhat later in life. It gradually disappeared from Lutheran theology, which now regards it either wholly or in part, reprobation, as conditional. Calvin firmly maintained the Augustinian doctrine of an absolute double predestination. At the same time he, in his defense of the doctrine against Piggyus, stressed the fact that the decree respecting the entrance of sin into the world was a permissive decree, and that the decree of reprobation should be so construed that God was not made the author of sin nor in any way responsible for it. The Reformed confessions are remarkably consistent in embodying this doctrine, though they do not all state it with equal fullness and precision. As a result of the Armenian assault on the doctrine, the canons of Dort contain a clear and detailed statement of it. In churches of the Armenian type the doctrine of absolute predestination has been supplanted by the doctrine of conditional predestination. Since the days of Schleiermacher the doctrine of predestination received an entirely different form. Religion was regarded as a feeling of absolute dependence, a hinegungsum well tall, a consciousness of utter dependence on the causality that is proper to the natural order with its invariable laws and second causes, which predetermine all human resolves and actions. 
and predestination was identified with this predetermination by nature or the universal causal connection in the world. The scathing denunciation of this view by Otto is none too severe, there can be no more spurious product of theological speculation, no more fundamental falsification of religious conceptions than this, and it is certainly not against this that the rationalist feels an antagonism, for it is itself a piece of solid rationalism, but at the same time a complete abandonment of the real religious idea of predestination. The idea of the holy, page 90. In modern liberal theology the doctrine of predestination meets with little favor. It is either rejected or changed beyond recognition. G. B. Foster brands it as determinism, Macintosh represents it as a predestination of all men to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, and others reduce it to a predestination to certain offices or privileges. In our day Bath has again directed attention to the doctrine of predestination, but has given a construction of it which is not even distantly related to that of Augustine and Calvin. With the reformers he holds that this doctrine stresses the sovereign freedom of God in his election, revelation, calling, and so on. The doctrine of the word of God, page 168, Roma Brief, 2nd ed, page 332. At the same time he does not see in predestination a predetermined separation of men, and does not understand election like Calvin as particular election. This is evident from what he says on page 332 of his Roma Brief. Camfield therefore says in his essay in Barthian Theology, entitled Revelation and the Holy Spirit Sad Smiley, page 92. It needs to be emphasized that predestination does not mean the selection of a number of people for salvation, and the rest for damnation according to the determination of an unknown and unknowable will. That idea does not belong to predestination proper. Predestination brings man into crisis in the moment of revelation and decision. It condemns him in the relation in which he stands to God by nature, a sinner, and in that relation rejects him, but it chooses him in the relation to which he is called in Christ, and for which he was destined in creation. If man responds to God's revelation by faith, he is what God intended him to be, an elect, but if he does not respond, he remains a reprobate. But since man is always in crisis, unconditional pardon and complete rejection continue to apply to everyone simultaneously. Esau may become Jacob, but Jacob may also become once more Esau. Says McConaughey, for Bath, and as he believes, for St. Paul, the individual is not the object of election or reprobation, but rather the arena of election or reprobation. The two decisions meet within the same individual, but in such a way that, seen from the human side, man is always reprobate, but seen from the divine side, he is always elect. The ground of election is faith. The ground of reprobation is want of faith. But who is he who believes? And who is he who disbelieves? Faith and unbelief are grounded in God. We stand at the gates of mystery. The significance of Karl Barth, pp. 240f.